Well, I'm I'm just saying that the people that normally are like that's that's called the great scientists, right? They've been whitewashed. We've taken away all their woo. We're taking away all their fringe topics, right? Newton spent as much time with alchemy, with occultism, and reading the Bible in very unique ways. His exegesis is quite unique, right? He was a heretic. The fact that he was also doing what is now considered real science was actually a secondary part of his studies. It, yeah. it, it, it was because in, in his time, all these things like astrology or astronomy, well, they were kind of similar. They were very much related. Oh, yeah. There, there was no like closed book on anything yet. So I just get frustrated with the fact that it is a thing that once you reach that, what I would call the high level of proper um, theoretical scientist, right? When, when you become really curious about the really complicated, big, unanswered questions, they are all in the same box, right? Whether it's the nature of God, the nature of time, the the the, the meaning of the universe, uh, the meaning of life, all uh, all of these completely out of this world questions that we still really don't have good answers to. But when you start asking these questions, you start looking at all of them almost at once, and they will kind of drive you mad. If you're lucky, like some of them are, you will find something profound and you will be able to keep it within a box that is something you can share with other people. So whether you're talking about uh, organizing the nature of, uh, of mathematics uh, or, or um, doing actual um, repeatable experiments on things like optics and the nature of light, or whether you're talking about... Uh, figuring out how all these astronomical numbers actually can be used to prove a theory of gravity. All, all of these things were their little piece of genius. But remember, they did it by simplifying what was known or what they saw, right? It's the same yeah. with someone like um, uh, Mendel when he... Uh, the nature of genetics have been intuitively known almost all throughout modern or, uh, well, kind of uh, modern uh, human history, right? Since we started breeding animals, we've had some idea of what was going on. The way that we interjected ourselves in forcefully selecting for specific traits, whether you're breeding pigeons or you're breeding dogs or horses or cows, <coughs> we did it, right? We we yeah. understood that something was happening in breeding and there, and there was a way to force traits to appear in the next generation. So I've genetics often, was... I've often wondered, you, you mentioned Mendel, uh, you know, I've often wondered if his, uh, his uh, realization is something that has been lost and discovered several times. It was. And what makes me believe that is looking in my local area here, uh, this is where uh, uh, maize, uh, corn, was developed over 8,000 years ago. And, uh, you know, uh, in the in the book... Um, uh, 1490, uh, uh, 1491, I think it's called. Uh, they talk about, you know, it's basically about before Columbus arrived. Um, uh, the, the author says, had, uh, had this been done, uh, the, uh, the development of maize, uh, today, that, that would have, uh, uh, evoked a Nobel Prize, uh, for, for that kind of astonishing, uh, you remember, uh, uh, evolution from a from an absolutely useless weed to, remember, uh, to the it, corn it, we it, know. They didn't really know how to use his his discovery, and it was actually forgotten for a century, uh, as far as I remember. Right, and then it was rediscovered that that he was onto something, and that's why he's actually uh, uh, got the name on it. Right, but but at his time, there was no real easy way to prove it and utilize it and, right. and 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 this is why but it was still simple enough that you could actually use it for uh very selective reading and and this is back to what what you said about rediscovering i think i think it's about the the 
what makes something uh, occult knowledge is when it's not yet shareable, when it's not yet formalized in a way where you can uh, multiply it and spread it and make sure that it becomes democratized. The, right. Another great right. example is how long between the invention of the Antikythera device until you got an equivalent mechanical uh, quality in modern uh, clocks or astrolabe, right? It, 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 it took many, many, many centuries, right? Almost, I'd say almost a thousand years. Oh, I, easily. I mean, you, you, know, you couldn't be, I don't think uh, uh, Western civilization could produce the Antikythera clock work uh, until we reached about uh, mid 1600s yeah, the point is that, that do that individuals most likely still had some of these things or rediscovered them because many of these mechanical things were it, it, are described in uh being done in uh, alexandria uh, sure. in, yeah. in 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 the 5th and 4th century bc so so it's not like it's it's completely out of left field but this actually enforces what i just said because you had this school of thought where everyone shared knowledge a lot, that meant that that it could grow. It became a science nexus, but then it collapsed, right? Yeah. And it's it's yeah. the same with the, the the House of Wisdom in, in Baghdad, where you also have this support from, quote unquote, the government that basically pour money into this. And then you get this blossoming of, of knowledge and then it's lost, right? This is yeah. what keeps happening until the modern age and and i'm inclined to say that the really kicker is that you don't get the enlightenment until you start being able to share knowledge fairly easily over big distances right yeah so, so and have the willingness uh, have the to willingness so, to yeah. share it because that's been yeah, a, and, you know the secrecy uh, you know the the guild uh, uh, concept was became so ingrained over time. You know that I, I often refer back to the book by Arthur Kessler called The Sleepwalkers. You know, and he basically accuses the uh, ancient Greeks, uh, our late uh, late Greeks, um, of cowardice because they had the tools to uh, create. Uh, you know, the tools that Tycho Brahe used. They could make those. Uh, the mathematics that Tycho Brahe and, and Johannes Kepler used, they could do that. And, and they basically, you know, there, there was Aristarchus the, from Samos saying, you know, the sun is in the center. The, you know, there's the everybody else or whatever saying the earth is in the center. And, uh, you know, and the failure to realize uh, the concept of, of ellipses uh, uh, you know, which uh, basically is, you know, Kepler's law, laws of planetary motion. The failure to to pursue that um, uh, and the sort of l uh, latching on to the geocentric system, which was actually, you know, way more complicated uh, because, they, of course, they hadn't done the research. You know, they, they hadn't watched the wandering stars uh, close enough at least as far as we know, you know, so much has been lost in antiquity. Uh, but they basically opted for the wrong system, you know, and we ended up for 2,000 years uh, doing the incredibly complicated um, epicycle mathematics in order to explain the retrograde motion of of, pla of planets. Uh, and, you know, this, this was so, in became so ingrained in us that, you know, even after Johannes Kepler came out with those laws, that kind of got ignored for another hundred years until Isaac Newton sort of wrote his laws of gravity. And then that got kind of ignored by most of the astronomers, you know, basically astrologers, uh, for about another two or three generations uh, before finally it died. You know, uh, and I, I look at that, I'm looking at what we're, we're seeing now. This is human nature. We're talking human nature here. And you're right, you know, the we they always clean things up. You know, they don't talk about, you know, how Einstein spent practically most of his uh, his life 
watching you know, watching TV, you know, was like and, and again, one of his yeah. favorite things to do. Or, or Isaac Newton uh, pursuing making gold from lesser uh, lesser metals, you know, that sort of gets. Or the fact that he his friends would carefully school him out of the way of the king because he was a um, uh, in the eyes of his contemporaries was a religious nut job <clears throat> and they didn't idiot. they didn't want the king to kill him <laughs> but it goes back to this this whole point of it's basically two points right it's the fact that people that are established or are uh, canonized into uh, the hall of fame of science right they are not as uniform or uh, single-minded as they are presented in the whitewashed image, right? And and this, I, I'm pretty sure you can go back and do this with pretty much every uh, established scientist in, in, in history. The reason that they do this is because, <clears throat> back to what I started saying with the fact that science does not become science and, until it's uh, commutable, until you can actually share it. Well, for something to be shareable, it has to be understandable. For something to be able to be taught, it has to be able to be formalized and put in the system. If this is too open-ended, if there's too many weird things or, or, or secondary uh, uh, theories that can't really be proven, well, they're useless in in education right because yeah. if you if you have a big hole in, in the knowledge that you're trying to teach you're going to have uh, students that keep asking you about that huge hole in your in your knowledge right let, 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 let's take uh, one of my favorite examples because it's something that i'm very closely relating to because i actually figured it out before the established science when i grew up they kept saying that the appendix had no function and you could just snip that, that thing out and throw it away. Well, the reason uh, I, I discovered that that's not the case is when I was actually in uh, working in fermentation uh, at Novo Nordisk, where we are, where we were producing insulin. And the way that you do that is you sit in a lab, you isolate a culture, then you upscale that culture and grow it in a big uh, glass uh, uh, container. And then you take that container and you pour, pour that thing into what was considered a pilot plant. It was a small uh, uh, plant uh, or, or um, uh, fermentation tank that was attached to a big one, right? Mm -hmm. And you just waited and, and let it grow in that little one first. So you didn't have uh, the added risk of if, if it fails, if the fermentation fails, you didn't have to uh, redo the entire tank, right? You right. Could basically just flush that one and then start that one again. And that's so the appendix. It's exactly <laughs> what the appendix does. It, it, Very it, interesting. It, 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 it isolates a small section where it can basically nurture it uh, with even more control and make sure there's no pathogens. And then in the case of an infection, it will still have that one protected. So it's basically a spare uh, biome. And and back then, I remember talking to my friends about it, and it didn't come out in a paper until I think it was sometimes in the 90s, late 90s or something like that. And I had actually already been uh, working uh, at that plant and, 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 and discovered it myself. And it was just one of those fascinating things. But if you are in an anatomy class, right, and you do not have the answer for that, your students are going to keep asking, but what about the appendix? Right. What's right. its function? And you just brush it aside. But if you have huge gaps in that in that knowledge, like you don't know how the eye works, like in Arabia, right? You can. Well, I, to... I, you know, I see. I see a parallel with that. With the, uh, of course, you know, the microbiome has also like brought to light so many amazing things. Uh, but I'm going to go in another direction on the, this one here. In the, in the, in the, with the concept of the Big Bang, you know, it basically is is some basic observations that got hammered together and said, this is it. This is the direction we're going to go, you know, and uh, it, it was learnable. It was easy to understand. Uh, and uh, it, so it became a very, very attractive model. But as time has gone by, you know, there, there's like, and of course now with the, with the, uh, the James Webb telescope, you know, we're, we're, 
it's being shaken quite radically. And uh, these foundations upon which it stands, you know, are, you know, speaking of people asking questions, you know, I've, I've put a couple of things on the web about the, the latest observations. And the people who come and ask questions, you know, they're not, these aren't experts, but they're like saying, well, you know, if, they're putting it together themselves. They say, well, look, if this isn't true, then how, you know, is, how can the redshift be, be, uh, um, uh, be a function of, of time, of measuring time? People aren't stupid. You know, they, they, start, to, they start to ask those appendix questions uh, that, that, uh, that happen. Um, if history is anything to go by, um, I think that the um, Big Bang will be alive and well for at least uh, two or three more generations, because the um, the basic uh, investment that's been made, which basically censors uh, papers, uh, say from Eric Eric Lerner, who's a plasma physicist, knows what he's talking about. His stuff is sound. Uh, they don't. They won't welcome that that I, into. I into I, honestly, the, I, I think you're stuff. wrong because uh, as I as I well, you've got you, a different different yeah, point of view I, of human uh, behavior than I do. <laughs> no, no, no. It's because uh, sure, people like Lerner and 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 uh, other of the heretics out there, and maybe yourself and maybe me, we would have been thrown out of the classroom uh, if we started asking questions like that. But it's just not true that it's that close because. If you start actually looking at uh, some of uh, the, the actual academics out there, you can say that they're still fringe, but they are discussing these things. And this science about the Big, da Big Bang has never really been closed. It's the same with something like Einstein and, 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 and relativity and all these things. These things have never really been closed down. It's just that the people that are still bothering asking these questions have been short, uh, sort of sidelined a little bit. And it's not that they're being ignored because they have their own little groups. I, I, I think I send you uh, one of the nice documentaries that actually tries to go through all of yeah. these. Uh, they, they get published like in electrical, in electrical um, not necessarily. Uh, journal, them, journals. They don't no, get published. Them, hey, some, hey, some they don't get published. Established. They do yes, not they do. get published in Astro. Yes. You show yes, me an do. Eric Lerner. Uh, no, 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 not Eric uh, Lerner. Eric uh, Lerner is is a published is publication not. in any of the in any of the uh, um, contemporary uh, uh, cosmological I, I'm trying to, uh, I'm, I'm journals. I'm trying to get to. I'm trying to get to the point, right? The the people like Lerner, the people uh, like Nassim Haramein, and and other people that actually start out in academia and then go completely overboard and just start challenging everything. With, without uh, uh, having a ground to stand on first. These people get ostracized. That's true. They do. But that's because sure. they are trying to sneak in, uh, again, back to Newton, they're, they're trying to sneak in uh, discussions about the eschaton and the end of days into a uh, Royal Society's lecture. That just does, does not belong there. If you're if you're here to tell us about general relativity, you're not supposed to start proving why uh, the Earth is older than six thousand years. That's not your job right now. Stop mixing the things. Stick to the topic. And and there's plenty of theoreticians out there that are getting published, that are reading each other's work and trying to um, have a discussion about things like uh, whether you're talking about the, the nature of the vacuum or uh, empty space, uh, Voronoi foams, uh, Casimir effects, uh, uh, quantum gravity, uh, string theory. Yeah. All of these things are the out The tangible there. things, the tangible observational things that, you know, that are, should be in the forefront. Uh, but yeah, what yeah, but we you get, also have what, uh, you also have the people what, talking hang about on, so uh, what we get what we get in um in uh, the uh, um in the big bang is you get a basic foundation and then you know like some things don't seem to fit so you make up something you know like inflation uh, and and the dark ages to uh, make, to put this thing together so that it has some uh, possible credibility 
but when when uh, the holes get poked in it, you know, you would think at that point uh, there would be an openness to new thought, uh, like Eric Lerner, who, who's not new thought. He's been around for thirty years that I know of, and I've been I've been following for a fair amount of time. Uh, what you get is uh, is a a closed school. Well, uh, and but, just like with just like with the with the uh, ge geocentric uh, system, it has to be protected, and it is protected by the uh, the group think uh, of the of the collective. And of course, you have, as I've mentioned before, you have the group think guardians who block anything new or anything. And I'm talking observational evidence here. I'm not talking about like some you know harebrained uh, you know what if it's a parallel universe and there's other infinite yous, which may be true or maybe not. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about absolute absolute observations that have been uh, that have been made and ignored. And that's oh, why that? that's why I know it to be, you know, it's really the Big Bang that is the heresy. It's just that there's it has such a following and is so ingrained in our society that it's not going to be let go of anytime soon. I just don't agree with you on on this part because I I feel like mm, you're protesting the the ostracizing, which is understandable, but you're doing it uh, on on the basis of saying that it's all about groupthink. I don't really think so. I I think the whole point of science goes back to the fact that you can come up with an actual theory that either has to be nearly self-evident so something that's so obvious that it proves itself that you've really got a a stroke of genius but otherwise if something is too weird to the current way of thinking or established knowledge or even the the scope of current um well consensus right take something like um you must be able to remember back in the day when well maybe not that way far back but how the whole term of fractals came about. This was one guy sitting there looking at some weird math and then starting to try and graphic, uh, Man, graphically God. represent it, right? And, and, and no one could really understand what he was trying to do because he could only work within a certain range, right? Because you just can't do by hand a million calculations. It's just right. not really possible. So everything was like on principle and and he kind of felt that he was onto something and it, it would maybe do something like that. It was all based on intuition because he could not really effectively graph that by hand. Until, until when, computers came along. Exactly. When the computer came around, he then took his weird theories, plugged it into that thing, and lo and behold, not only was that stuff real, it became a whole branch. And it was like, and it was visually wonderful. I mean, the, you know, the amazing. Mandelbrot uh, uh, configuration are just absolutely astonishing. I mean, you know, you get to jump to the front of the line uh, with yeah. something like that because of uh, how breathtaking it is. But in uh, in a uh, big in the Big Bang cosmology and in cosmology, that those those kind of breakthroughs are very few and far between. What we have had, and and it just still blows me away every morning when I wake up, is that the uh, James Webb Telescope has looked into the dark ages and there is none. Uh, and that to me is like a an amazing. It's, like, it's as, almost as if uh, the large chunk of ice just ripped the side of the Titanic, and everybody's standing on board looking at the ice chunks on the deck and going, "How oh, how quite." fascinating not realizing that that the the edifice upon which they sail is is about to go under and, and it, it's just an amazing moment in time that and i'm so excited that i'm actually alive uh, to see such an astonishing um, moment occur in in history i mean the, these these don't come along uh, very often uh, if you've well, noticed it's, it, it's again it's again it, it's it's back to um the point of I think I made it in the last episode when we talked about things like flat earth. Well, un until you need some other model for your reality, you are fine with flat earth. It, it, it's, um, 
it's the same with the whole Big Bang thing, right? It it makes it easier, just like the old age of the Earth being six thousand years. And remember, there's still people that believe that. Probably more now than ever. Yeah, and 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 the point is that until we started seeing the 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 layers, geological layers, and actually trying to figure out and understand how those things form, well, there was no proof otherwise, or at least there was no strong evidence would be accepted by the establishment, right? So Yeah, so this about is the flat earthers, I just want to uh, 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 expand on that for a second. You know, I just read a, a, um, a, a uh, I don't know if I read, a, a read it or if I saw it on, uh, on the computer, but apparently uh, the concept that everybody believed the earth was flat through the dark ages, the middle ages, and, uh, you know, into the rent is not true. Apparently, not in, true. like, yeah. people, people in the, even the humblest villages sort of like, yeah, you know, they knew the earth was round. Uh, I think somehow uh, uh, the sort of conceit of uh, the technological, you know, industrial revolution and all was uh, like, liked to look back and say, oh my God, weren't they just absolute ignorant peasants? Uh, and uh, I don't, apparently that's being debunked uh, uh, by, uh, uh, by what, you know, were there flat earthers? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, but it, it seems like you know if you're writing something that's totally a harebrained uh, nut juice, uh, you're more likely to get published than the, you know the common wisdom of you know is it around is a uh, is the earth around yeah well, everybody knows the earth is round that's sort of what history is starting to sort of discover for us and I, I find that rather fascinating. But it, 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 the, the problem with things like the deep cosmology is that if if you when you start expanding into something like deep time whether you're talking geological deep time evolutionary deep time uh or you're talking about cosmological deep time you always seem to end up with the problem of infinity if you start opening up the door ajar right so so the big bang was kind of like oh, funny it came out of a theologian of course but um it it made it easier that okay everything started there because the alternative might actually be there was no start or the whole point it it's whether you're talking about big bang or whether you're talking infinity when you start questioning these things and i still see them coming out what was before well if if there's a start time there is no before if there yeah, is um, infinity uh, of time, the whole term before makes no sense because there's infinite before. Right. Right. I, I just want to say something real quick. You know, I'm not it's not that uh, I I don't have a horse in the race personally, whether there was a big bang or or if it's infinity. I'm just saying that this model of what a big bang was is turning out to be a boondoggle. This yeah. this version of what maybe in the future they'll find something else, but the uh, this one here, you, you've you've got to be suspicious from the very moment of its creation when it you you know you're looking at a, a Belgian Catholic priest saying you know uh, you know here's the concept. Uh, and the Catholic Church going, oh yeah, that's great. The first three words of the Bible in the beginning. I mean, you can, and it's incredibly attractive to the human soul because we have you know, we have an absolute sort of faith in the idea that there's a beginning and there's an end. I mean, you look at anything in nature, you know, from a snail to a porcupine, you know, they have a beginning, they have like they're born and, and everything dies. And that's an incredibly attractive, uh, I would say like deep psychological uh, uh, sort of embedded in us. And the concept of infinity, which I'll let you get into, uh, I'll stop babbling in a second. I just, I just want to say infinity is hard. You know, it's uh, it's really, it really uh, taxes the mind. And I'm sure that uh, so, um, countless people have gone mad uh, thinking about the concept of inf infinity, because it, it is really um, you know, I don't think we as humans can totally grasp that idea. Uh, and, and like I say, does it exist or is it is it a beginning and an end thing? I don't know. But this particular 
place and time with this big bang this ain't it but that that's really my point here when when you're talking about the infinitesimal so thinking about nothing makes no sense i know that that some will say well you have zero and uh in mathematics you can easily uh account for when something is missing or, or nothing no you can't it's exactly as complex as infinity it makes no sense nothing makes no sense and infinite makes no sense so th that is why we always have to choose our scale how 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 much can we manage within the system that we're looking at mm -hmm. and 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 this goes back to i did it last time everyone that listened to someone like democritus when he talked about atoms as a thought experiment as a logical rhetorical discussion topic it makes sense right it's it's it the 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 nature of of physical things matter right um would be sensitive to this which is basically a xenon's arrow right it's basically the uh the the achilles and the tersus right it's basically if you keep halving something at some point you should reach something that you can't halve Right. I use I, if I'm catching you right, you're basically saying, you know, we as human beings are caught within whatever limits we can see within the macro and the microcosm yeah. in the cause our cosm. Our cosm is, you know, is limited until we discover yet another. I think maybe you could say in, in cosmology, uh, it's the uh the you know, the great sucking event that they've uh, they've discovered where everything seems to be going in a in a in a in a specific direction. That's kind of the very lip on the extreme. Uh, and of course we see the same with uh with rape wavelengths, you know, we, we know what the uh you know we 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 know we know nothing. We you know we've got the plank, uh, you know, the, you know the smallest the smallest quantity going in the other direction. By the way, you know, into the infrared. Uh, I sometimes wonder is the if the gravity, uh, um, uh, you know, the, these huge big uh, long uh, devices we've created to measure gravity. And remember, this is new. This is new stuff. We've never. We've never really done this before, but I, I'm wondering if we're grabbing the wrong stick. I wonder if uh, if they are actually looking at infrared in the extreme rather than gravitational. I mean, it, it, I think it's something that that is entirely possible for if for no other reason than this is pioneering stuff. You know, we're we're pushing. Uh, we're pushing the limit. Limits are fun because we keep wanting to go further in our cosms in both in both directions. But you're absolutely right. You know, th we we are myopic creatures in a uh, you know in a small uh, sphere of experience. That's and this is where it is. This is this is where things like our uh, fractal math example is is valid, right? Because if you say took a your you took your 4k tv right and you drew a fractal on it this is very easy to do now but if you showed that to the early uh adopters and actual uh people calculating these things on the first computers it would blow their mind out of calculations that are required to fill the graphical representation of your fractal equation on that screen is mind blowing. And yeah. luckily people, people like you and I can sit here and, and not really grasp it because it's not really understandable, but you and I were around with the early computers, right? Yes. We actually, uh, had some of the first personal we saw computers. the transfer between no computers and computers on a personal <laughs> level yeah oh by the way and just the to, to add uh, to, to add a little touch to what you're saying uh, uh my friend scott tobias came up to me in the early 90s and started rambling at me about hypertext and i i just thought to myself Oh God, there goes Scott again, you know, on some kind of weird thing. Like I, I don't understand what the friggin' hell he's talking about. And then, you know, a few years later, you know, I see hypertext in action and I went, Oh, 
Okay. Because just, it was just, made just, material. Just to put this in perspective to the people out there that might actually be listening to this, when you take your current smartphone, if you take a picture with that smartphone, and then you go back to, say, 84, and you want to store that image, how big a building do you think you would need <laughs> to have a hard drive that could actually store that image? Try yeah, to go and do that math. That would be a very funny little equation because you're going to yeah. end up with something like the entirety of America covered in eight, in eight stories or something because that's how big hard drives were back then. I'm yeah. just saying that that the amount of calculations we can do today is going to bring about a new kind of science. We're not really stepping into that fully yet, but I think we are very close because when you start looking at interactions on a cosmological scale and what we basically we have started doing it a little bit with the with the simulations of uh, uh of, of of things like uh, galaxies colliding and stuff like that but we haven't done this effectively on the micro scale yet and this is what i wanted to talk about today because this all comes back to we have to start revisiting some of the old ghosts of science we have to revisit them. We have to acknowledge them, and we have to talk about them on mm, new premises with 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 new assumptions. Right? Sure, gravity is not like Lesage said because it's not gravitons, it's not Higgs particles. That's not really what's happening on the gravitic scale. We also have to start talking about things like ether even though you want to call it something else, quantum gravity, whatever. I don't care what you end up putting on this thing as a label, but the way that that actual energy and waves... I'm, um, I'm comfortable are, with the word uh, uh, space fabric. Uh, that, that suits me just fine. Yeah, and, 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 and the point is that the space fabric is not nothing. This is what is so important to start acknowledging. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is, this is it's, not it's the blind that, spot. That, yeah, and 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 sure, scientists have kind of put it in a little box and said, let's not deal too much with this because the public are not ready to talk about this. But they all know this. It is not a secret. They have known this for 100 years, that this thing needs to be discussed. But we didn't have any tools to do so. Right. Because this is back to the fact that, well, until you have a method or a tool to look at these things, they don't matter. Whether you're talking about what is it that carries uh, Mendel's law of genetics, no. well, until we actually saw DNA, you couldn't really talk about this. Until I think there are two, that two important things that we need to, you know, first of all, you need the imagination. Three. <laughs> first, you need the imagination. Second thing you need is the observation, the tools to see it. And the, the, the third is to put it into some kind of uh, of context once you know you know because there are various ways you can interpret observation so you know you have to uh, an observation has to fit in a jigsaw puzzle into into a larger jigsaw puzzles of other observations that fit hand in glove if they don't do that then you, you know you've got to go back to the drawing board you can't sit there trying to hammer uh, you know, round pegs and square holes. And, and uh, again, it's the human condition that we tend to do that. Now, you have more, you have an optimistic uh, approach to, to it, and uh, I well, admire that. I, and I, you I, may I, be right, and I'm hoping you are. <laughs> well, I see all the parts being almost ready, right? So you will hear cosmologists talk about this uh, concept like... Uh, the flatness of the universe and this already gives most people the headache so they just push it aside and say i can't talk about this but it's not that complicated really it is but it's not everyone knows that if i was an architect and i wanted to make uh i don't know a big house uh, that was square right uh, sorry uh, that was uh uh triangular right a triangular house right if i wanted to build that like a tetrahedral pyramid that I could be buried in. Well, if I'm building this in Denmark or Holland, very easy. Nine, and I would basically do uh, uh, the 180 degree sum when I'm measuring this out, right? Very simple. 
I'm in a nice flat country. 180 creates a triangle. Fine. But if Stephen was still living in England, he would have a problem because he might actually end up with this weird thing where the sum of the angles are either higher than 180 or lower, depending on whether he was in the valley or up on the hill. So this is the nature of mm, Euclidean and flat geometry, right? So, so this is very, very easy to understand topography. If you're in something that is a valley, it will be narrower. If you're on a hill, you will have a bigger sum, right? When you're drawing your triangle. Now comes the kicker, and this is where it gets strange and a little bit hard to imagine, but it is the same thing in a higher dimension. When you go up a dimension, it, it's the same problem. Oh, I see what you mean. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. if I say that in this solar cavity, so inside uh, the heliopause, I'm saying, well, in this space, the mm, curvature of space is less than flat. But outside, mm -hmm. it's higher than flat. Well, if anything is measured through a valley and then a hill, well, if I'm only looking at the sum result, it's going to be flat. How will yeah, I, I think, know? Uh, How will I, think, I know? Yeah, I, I think in in space, you know, in uh, you know, you're talking uh, uh, about the fabric of space. I think, you know, the uh, the concept, you know, if you cre if you created a uh, an, um, you know a subspace an absolute vacuum. I mean the surrounding uh, space, uh, whether you call it uh, uh, you know space fabric or time space fabric, would go ape shit. You know, and I never I never see that discussed uh, uh, anyway. You know, it's like the the concept of of uh, of uh, producing, and I mean physically producing uh, a nothingness it is like, you know, I scour the books. I look all the time to see if, you know, if, uh, if, if, if this is being, you know, considered, uh, I, I just feel like I'm just a figure in a landscape in an empty this landscape. Is where, it's like, okay. there's you and, and maybe a couple of other people who, who have that in their noggin, you know, well, and, it's because it, it, it because it, it's because it, it's, you need to start looking at the, the the macro analogies. And we know that the universe seems to like to do things in scalar uh, effects. So small scale, big scale, but similar principles. Very much the same thing. It 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 it, it mirrors just on a on a on a on a new scale and a new layer. Different different, manis cool. different manifestations uh, in uh, in through the macro to the micro. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and again, this is back to the fact that uh, when you go and watch uh, uh, Star Wars, right? Well, the galaxy in Star Wars was, was made with cream in a coffee cup. Yeah. Literally. Uh, I yeah. kid you not. That's how it's done. It's because that thing up there is very similar to what's in your coffee cup when you start stirring it. The point is, we need to look at these analogies and then start to see, okay, this is the type of 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 science and math that we need to understand these things and this is what i think when 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 the theory of of the quantum foam and also called the voronoi foam which is basically that space is foaming down at the subplank level yeah. this is well, okay, let's back up for a second because uh, you 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 hit on something interesting that is you know the the star trek thing done in a coffee cup uh, you know and there you have basically a, a vortex it is a uh, you know it, it is basically kepler's second law of planetary motion but what happens as you know when you get out into the when you get out to the 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 spiral arms you know it breaks down 
suddenly everything's pretty much turning roughly at the speed uh, uh, as the center of the galaxy, which of course has inaugurated this, you know, well, it must be dark matter. I mean, how could it possibly think anything to do with plasma or, you know, or, or the electric, uh, the electric, and it just, that kind of blinkeredness uh, is, uh, is I think what we're dealing with now. And we've just spent 10, 15 years uh, trying to uh, verify dark matter. And we've basically, to my knowledge, uh, We've drawn a blank to the, to date with that, and, I, and what I'm seeing here, Jakob, is uh, an overlay of uh, you know, yeah, there was you know, there you've got the center of the galaxy spinning round, but it's almost as if 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 you've been near a dam and you see the vortices around the dam, or there's all this foam that gets created, and it's turning roughly around a vortex, turning at the same speed as the vortex itself, uh, you know, in the, in the center. And, uh, and, you know, it suggests that the fabric of space within this, this area is affected by something. Yeah. You know, they've looked at dark matter. So we've done, we've gone through the, we've gone through the gravitational formula dance and it ain't that. You know, well, but, but, and it's very it, hard. It seems very hard for cosmologists who are in love with gravity because it's so easy to calculate gravity. You know, three body problem. Okay, uh, but it's so easy to deal with that. But when it becomes messy, when it becomes uh, when you're dealing with um, when you've scaled up bubbles uh, next to each other, you know, foam, <laughs> the foam. Uh, when you get out to to that layer. Of, of trying to mathematically understand it, and we don't have the tools for it. There's sort of like a collapse in uh, in cosmology because you know we don't have the knowledge of plasma behavior. We are we sure you know we know of double layers. You know there are things that we do know, but you know the uh, you know we know of plasmoids. You know we know something about it, but we don't know enough, uh, and we're sort of caught. In a in a sort of a stasis at the moment in terms of how the the uh, the gal how galac galaxies manage to pull off this trick we don't know how that is yet um, and it it's, uh, it it should be fertile ground for other you know for for other ways of considering what it might be other than just dark matter uh, as an explanation and, and I will give some uh, astronomers. And the cosmologists credit for saying we call it dark matter, but we really don't know what it is. And to me, that is the most honest, honest uh, uh, statements that I, I've heard from that quarter. Well, I think I think my, my point of view is, and I, I, I could be completely wrong, but I've I, I got a very strong sense that if you start looking at these things, when you take things like the quantum foam into your considerations and how the, this thing must be seething and basically theoretically have well not infinite energy but a very large number of, uh, of energy available per cubic centimeter um, the whole zero point discussion but but my, my point is really this the the only way you can access this is the same as go all the way back to one of the very old thermodynamics thing with Maxwell's demon that is standing there opening a little door. Um, well, the only way you can get access to this vacuum energy, this, this zero point energy, is when you have a difference. Because otherwise it can't make any work. This is, this is like science 101. This is not complicated. Well, you will not be able to, to utilize the zero point energy if you're seething in it. You have to have access to somewhere where there's a difference. This is also true in, in, in electronics, right? Pressure. If you have an ele electric uh, differential, you're, you're not going to have any fucking work being done. Right. So my point is, if you start looking at this, it starts giving you some hints of what's really going on, and it resolves so many problems in our current science. Because this is the nature of, in my opinion, of, um, of gravity. And I will take you to a topic that I know that uh, you're very familiar with, beer, right? How do you get a, a, a poured draft beer to stop foaming? You put your finger on it. 
This is one of those very old ones. But the point is that as soon as there is something that the that the bubbles and the foam can actually collapse around, it will collapse around it. And no. this is similar when 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 you have uh, if you have a foam with a certain call it foam density. I'm going to call it energy density just so so we can start moving forward. You have one foam with one energy density and another foam with a higher or lower energy density. You will have work going from one direction to the other. This will express itself as a, call it a gradient, that will actually arise as gravity. This is what gravity is. And as soon as you have a physical medium, so matter, matter is basically something that is pulled out of the vacuum and it is something that is less en energy dense than no matter so what you then get is you get the actual dense energy dense foam pushing on the body this is true whether you're talking about a neutron whether you're talking about an electron whether you're talking about uh, a star or a galaxy you will have this gradient and it's going to behave and push on everything that it can in a similar way to um, almost like osmosis, right? No one would challenge the theory of, of how osmosis work in water based on some, well, what about the particles moving that's going to heat up the water? No, it's not. It's going to be trying to move from one salinity to another. Same with one energy density to another. This creates a potential push on the energy that is less dense because it wants to and, and that push is indistinguishable from gravity it is exactly what gravity is that is the nature of gravity it it is it is a, 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 an energy density or even a space time density because at that scale this is the smallest thing that it can do so it's basically your your fundamental grid so it does exactly what you've seen on all the models there's no need for new equations it it will behave exactly the same way there's just no particles involved because it's happening under the Planck scale this yeah. is back to the Casimir effect right so the way you get particles from the foam is basically by having these well then you start talking about vibrational energies and and waves but the point is that you can get particles to appear when you do that you will have your basic energy density, which is the way that this whole thing fluctuates or basically oscillates, vibrates, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Oscillates. And then you will have this area where it does not oscillate the same way because it's kind of being mm, like a boundary. It, it 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 it's it's stopped because it's got this little thing that is like a particle that is actually bouncing on the foam but it's not bouncing because this is in 3d so it's it's oscillating yeah it's, it's almost helio seismology <laughs> and and this is where you get to other experiments if you start looking at what happens when you try to do this with the liquid uh in what's called the singing bowl experiment uh what you basically get is you get this this strange surface of course in space it's not a surface it's a brain Right. You get this brain situation where the brain state is able to hold particles, in this case, bubbles on top of the oscillating surface. So you get a surface with a new surface on top. But at that point, it hinders the oscillation. So that means that the base oscillation of the entire bowl is hindered at this small area around the particle that's on top of it. And then you get to things like the pilot wave uh, experiment that actually also explains, call it a macro scale version of the two slit experiment. This is back to the point that every time you have a particle, a particle is weird because it is a particle is a potential wave and a wave is a potential particle. Yeah, you every know, particle. it's interesting. While you're saying that, just thinking like how everything is an oscillation. Like take, for instance, you know, uh, you or me, you know, we wake up in the morning and then we go about doing whatever it is, brushing our teeth and then going to work or whatever you're doing. And then you come back into a um, 
a sort of an inner circle area where you oscillate inside your house, you know, and you're oscillating there, and then you sleep, and then you oscillate within this envelope, and then you're on for a sleep outside of this envelope. And it's so interesting that you can you can take the oscillation concept to almost uh, like uh, any realm of the micro and macrocosm. Uh, I'm uh, I don't know if you. I've just been reading up on uh, they've discovered that protons have a bucket load more gluons in them than they hitherto thought. Uh, and I just thought, you know, they're just interesting how they, you know, they find. And I have to say, past the electron and proton, to to me, it's almost all Greek. You know, they, the leptons and the muons and the gluons and, and all that. But, I, you know, I just sort of fo follow it vaguely. But, you know, you know, all these things oscillate. And a friend of mine, David McClintock, yesterday and we chat from time to time. We were both joking over the fact that, you know, an, an electron oscillates, I think it's one to the 17 times a second. So as it oscillates in there's, there it is, there's your uh, electron. Now it's gone for one times 10 to the 17th second. Um, and then it's back again. So it could be maintaining uh, a, point on my nose here and then for another one uh 10 to the 17th uh 10 to the uh, plus 17 seconds minus 17 seconds would be on y Jakob's nose for a split second and now just take all the electrons there are and they're just busy building everything all the time so that you know you're really you know uh you, you know the, the the electron says nice being here Sorry, I've got to go. There's a bucket uh, over on the east side of London uh, that I have to be part of the handle of that for a split second, then I'm off again. And so it does all these chores in uh, one times 10 to the minus 17 seconds. And it's like, and my friend said, well, maybe you only need one electron in the entire universe. <laughs> well, and, and, and that's again back to the whole point of when you're talking about this, when you look at these scales, time loses its uh, it, 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 it's a boundary uh, event where things down there are happening so fast that you can say they're near instantaneous. And if you're talking, as soon as you start going towards that, then you're at the problem. If it became infinite, then there's only the need of one particle. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so, it, it, so the the point I, I'm I'm trying to make here is that we do have the analogous models to start coming up with a theory that is better than what we had. Basically, in my opinion, what we have been working with when you're talking about something like uh, well, whether it's Einstein or Newton, is comparable to. Einstein or Newton trying to work with Aristotle's uh, gravity model. That That's how different it will be. If you sure. start looking yeah. at this, then you will also be able to understand so much more about the behavior of matter, the reason it does what it, what it does. And of course, there's also hints in, in plasma physics, but plasma physics gets a little bit more tricky because it's a macro scale of many particles moving at extreme speeds but it it does a lot of the same things right so whether you have a lot of electrons on a, uh as a charge in in a layer uh, uh in the air and it creates uh, a lightning bolt right when it basically discharges uh, in into the earth well the way that that plasma seems to move is very similar to how a galaxy actually moves through space the point is, there is no such thing as constant cycle or orbits. Mm -hmm. No orbits are stable. I know that 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 a lot of uh, people out there likes to think that the Earth just is in a stable orbit around the Sun. That's just not true. It's only yeah. true because you're looking at a very small scale. Yeah, Milosevic uh, sort of has pretty much uh, sort of. Uh 
proven that. Uh, I just want to say, you know, one of the things that we're, you know, we're both we, we're both talking about from time to time is is the, the is something that we really have only just started to grasp is the instantaneousness of entanglement uh, and how that fit fits in to to this uh, picture of the uh, of the cosm, both in the micro and the macro sense. Um, I I'm suggest. Uh, 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 hang on a second, uh, uh, Jakob. Just, I just want to say, uh, on a practical level, we're we're sort of at the end of an hour, and then a little bit more. So I want to let's 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 summarize uh, uh, for for now, and we'll 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 be back next week with another exciting edition. But uh, let's give it two more minutes to uh, to I finish up. I just wanted to close it with the, the the point that everything that is in an orbit is either uh, moving away from or collapsing into its central focal point. Stable orbits are only stable because our scale of time is just too limited. So whether you're That's talking right. about the moon moving either away from us with three centimeters per year or one centimeter per year, doesn't matter. It's still the same thing. It's just because time gets... Uh, expanded instead of compressed and and, and it, in it, it and in stable. a uh, few sentences you've basically described that everything oscillates <laughs> yeah, exactly. everything it, is it, an it, oscillation it, it's, it's all oscillation it's just a matter of on what scale and 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 what i wanted to to do is take us back to the fact that many of our theories always tend to assume these stabilities limitations and looking at a system only within a certain box. And that's fine if it's useful. But one of the things that I would like to talk about next time is that I think that many of the models about mm, stellar formation, so whether you're talking about how stars are formed or planetary systems are formed, are also based on this inferred type of logic. Saying, yeah, well, this is going to be our initial state, Oh. It, it, it's almost like a cook that on a TV show saying, I've already prepared a dough. Well, that's not how it happens in the real world. You have to have progression. You have to have this uh, development or call it evolution. And it has to be this bifurcation and, and uh, development of, of things. And I honestly think that our old ideas about accretion and, and, and disks and all that, I think it's missing something. I think it's missing something really vital that I yeah. will talk about next time. Yeah, I think that's a great idea and a good way uh, way to start off. The uh, I'm, I'm, I'll start off as well next week with a little bit on on the uh, the uh, stellar the Heisenberg uh, uh, no the sorry uh, the stellar chart kind of how how. Uh, how your brain starts to dissolve when you start to reach the age of 70. Uh, but anyway, I'll talk, talk about uh, a little bit about stellar evolution too, starting next week. So uh, we, you and I can continue, but I'm going to say goodbye to everybody who has presently been watching this and hope to see you in the next uh, realm of time.